Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are in the world, welcome back to The Caring Economy with me, Toby Usnick. Today is a particularly fun day for me because I have our friend Lily Cantor on. Harlan and I have known Lily for many, many years, but she's also this incredible superwoman of an entrepreneur. She is a serial entrepreneur. She's had at least five startups to check on her belt. She was co-founder of Serena and Lily and founder of Boone Supply, and most recently, the co-founder of Avery Lily. Lily has over 35 years of experience in the business and technology fields. She has held management positions for Microsoft, Deloitte and Touche, and she created the first Microsoft flagship store, earning her the Chairman's Award from Bill Gates in July 1999. And I believe, if memory serves me correctly, she's even been on the cover of Time magazine. Lily Cantor, welcome to The Caring Economy. Thank you. Happy to be here. Am I right that you were on the cover of Time magazine? Yes, I was. Tell us about that. Well, you know, when I created the Microsoft Store, which I did with Harlan, I realized that the people working there, we hired a lot of people inside of the South of Market, disadvantaged area of San Francisco. I realized that these young people, I would say they were 18 to 25 from all racial backgrounds, they could run circles around us Microsoft people as far as working on the PCs and getting around the technology. And I thought to myself, my goodness, these people should have jobs in the tech world. And it really bothered me that they didn't. Um, that they were just working retail hourly. So I asked a a, a number of them, um, would you be interested in getting certified in technology? And they all said yes with enthusiasm. So 15 of them, I helped get certified, Microsoft Certified Professional. I mentored these young people every week. We'd go for coffee and they all got certified and a number of them got amazing jobs afterwards. And so Time Magazine at the time was doing an article on direct philanthropy and people who were rolling up their sleeves and actually going in. And so instead of just writing a check to some large org, Time called Microsoft and asked them, do you know any of your employees are doing this? And they were like, yeah, there's some woman down in San Francisco doing something. That's how it happened. I mean, truly, you're the only person in my world I know who's actually been honored as such. So let's go back to the very beginning, Lily. We always ask our guests to tell us a little bit about their life story, maybe a couple of minutes digest of where you're born, how you're raised, where or who your mentors were along the way. Yeah, so I grew up in Kansas City, Missouri. Both of my parents worked in, the, in disadvantaged areas. My mother taught school her whole life. And my father was the head of the free health clinic in Kansas City. So I grew up with uh, parents that really devoted their lives to social purpose. I graduated in the 80s. It was all about business. And I got an accounting degree and I became a CPA. In a couple of years time, I was bored to tears as a CPA, but I had a client who was a crazy entrepreneur and he invited me to come and help him with a startup. So I wrote his business plan. I did all his Lotus 123 forecasting, we raised $6 million to go and open up office products, warehouse clubs. And we opened 11 of them. This is before Staples and Office Mm -hmm. Depot and all of these others. We opened 11 OP clubs throughout Arizona and uh, Utah and Southern California. And we were then bought by Bismart, who who was then bought by Office Max. But Really early in my career, rolled up my sleeves. I was an entrepreneur with this gentleman. We did it. We rolled out 11 of these. And then I jumped the aisle because the venture guys that were investing in that invited me to come to another one of their startups to be the controller. And that was in the technology integration world. So systems integration. And I really cut my teeth on vertical retail technology for five years. I worked for them. And then I went back to Deloitte and Touche and managed their technology retail consulting. And from there, I got recruited into Microsoft. 1994 to 2000, amazing years to be at Microsoft. Got pregnant with my first baby and decided not to go back to corporate America. I was on a plane about four days a week. Decided to open up a baby and kids store and put my baby in a stroller and stroll him into downtown Mill Valley. And that store was Mill Valley Baby and Kids. Then I was at the hospital 
giving birth to baby number two and Serena Dugan walked in my door with her gorgeous portfolio, left it. And my store manager's like, Lily's going to love your work, but she's having a baby today. I, I'm sure she's going to get a hold of you. The baby was, I think Zeke might've been 20 hours old when I came into the store, not a day yet. I was doing show and tell. I was waiting for my two-year-old to get into a nap. And my manager of the store showed me this gorgeous portfolio from Serena. And I said, oh my God, it's so beautiful. And so I called her up and she's like, hold on a second. Are you the woman that was having the baby yesterday? <laughs> yeah. When are we going to meet? She's like, okay, you're crazy. But yeah, let's meet in like a week or two. <laughs> I'm not kidding you when I say that Serena and I spent two hours together and we started three businesses in two hours. Wow. And she was a decorative painter. And so I hired her to do decorative painting for the store. She was a artist and I hired her to do a lot of artwork because I had a G clay art business at the time. And then she had a textile portfolio. I said, I love your work. Can see that on a baby bumper. She left the store that day and she called her husband at the time and said, I think something really big just happened. <laughs> So yeah, Serena and Lily was born that day, and that was in October of 2003. And a year later, we were shipping our baby bedding into 400 independent specialty stores nationwide. Wow. And within the first couple of years, we actually did Jen Garner's Nursery and a number of others, Jessica Alba. It was an era. You know, Serena and I both are kind of like, go big or go home. I think the minute we launched the company, we thought we were Ralph Lauren. I mean, it was a lot of moxie. We saw it as a lifestyle brand from, from the day we launched it. But what you have that Ralph doesn't have is the mother's intuition. And you know exactly what a baby needs. It was a funny time because there was no really high-end baby bedding. There's expensive children's baby's clothing, yeah. which um, always baffled me because they grow so yeah. quickly. From there, just why don't you just give us almost like a laundry list of the, the businesses you've started and what they are. You're a serial entrepreneur, and I don't want to get it wrong. I started the first Microsoft store, and you know Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer uh, gave us $6 million to go and implement that project. After that, I started Mill Valley Baby and Kids, which I ended up selling after Serena and Lily took off. The most recent, well, the two most recent businesses since 2018, I bought the assets of a school fundraising company. Um, I left Serena and Lily after 12 and a half years of running a marathon. I hired a CEO to run the company and scale it. We had already kind of opened retail. We were very omni-channel at the time. And at this point, it just became about scale. Mm -hmm. And after 12 and a half years of running this marathon, I decided to take a break. I took a year off and I bought the assets of a school fundraising company that was already in 7,000 schools across the United States selling eco grocery bags and they were on paper forms. So I thought there was an opportunity to disrupt the market and build a digital platform mm -hmm. and really lean into zero waste living and zero waste kitchen and zero waste lunch. So we bought the assets in 2018 and we digitized the business. And in 2019, we literally did $20 million in sales. We have given back $103 million through the platform with the acquisition of Mixed Bag Designs. It's a really powerful platform. We give back 40% of the revenue back to schools, digitized a GoFundMe platform sitting on top of Shopify. Ecom meets fundraising using product. Unfortunately, COVID was pretty disruptive to the business because we only were in schools and team sports, two industries that got pummeled in 2020, 2021. So we're kind of clawing our way back in 2022 now. And it's it's been rough, to be honest with you. I did hire a CEO to really help me re-energize the business in this past June. He's doing an amazing job. And we have some really cool things that we're working on right now. I did start another company because I am just like that, but I started another design company out of Hawaii called Avery Lilly. And it was an interior designer that I met when I was in Hawaii for a couple of years. We're going to be doing a lot of move-in basics, but we have a beautiful interior design studio. I recently listened to an interview you did with Microsoft Alumni Network. I recall you're saying that one of the lessons learned was when to bring the talent in to run or help you out instead of doing it all yourself. Can you talk a little bit? About yeah, I absolutely think it's so important for everyone to kind of 
understand and be self-aware of where their superpowers are. I know my superpower is in being an entrepreneur. I enjoy starting things. I am so fueled by the creativity of the soul uh, when it comes to creation. And I know that when I'm in meetings all day long and worrying, you know, working on process calibration and team org reorg calibration, that that is not a superpower for me. I kind of glaze over a bit. I just know that it's time to bring in like what I call adult supervision um, to help scale the vision. And um, I just know that I'm not jumping out of bed in the morning to yeah. go and, you know, do process calibration. You know, when I birth something, I want to give it the best odds for huge success. That's why I like to surround myself with people who do things better than I do. Think they're really different skill sets. I don't think people who know how to take a hundred million to a billion are actually good at creating things. I, I think it's just a different skill set. You and I have been both fortunate to work at great companies. You know, it was American Express, New York Times, Christie's. Microsoft, I think, was that for you. This alumni network suggests that. Can you talk a little bit about your Microsoft experience and then also just about solid brands and leadership within them? Yeah. I mean, Microsoft was honestly the best company I worked for. The culture there really encouraged innovation. It encouraged healthy competition. They would have multiple teams working on the exact same project, you know, and let the best win. And there was a healthy competition. They rewarded failure. They absolutely rewarded failure. If you failed big at Microsoft, that meant a big promotion. It didn't mean they were going to show you the door because honestly, the last thing they wanted to do was have those learnings go to their competitor. So, you know, they really fostered innovation, failing. I definitely learned a lot about how to foster innovation inside of a company. Plus, I worked there at a really good time. That afforded me the ability to be an entrepreneur. You know, I, I was able to seed my own startup. Serena and Lily did not raise an institutional round until four and a half years um, after it launched. And I was able to seed capital and then I was able to raise friends and family. And then from there, we did an institutional round in 2008 of all times. It seems to me one of your, your pivots was going from tech to Serena and Lily. Uh, you've talked in the past about how Silicon Valley and Sand Hill was probably not the best match for you for fundraising for a business. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, you know, there's so many lessons learned as a first time entrepreneur. I think the biggest one is alignment of capital, understanding what your investor is, what's their superpower of investing and what vertical do they understand. We unfortunately took capital from Sand Hill Row because we were growing so fast at the time. They saw, you know, a hockey stick of growth and invested in it. But the reality of building a retail company that's high growth, you've got high working capital needs mm -hmm. of inventory. And especially in the home decor industry, we're talking about two turns a year if, on a good day. And that is just a cash incinerator for growth. A lot of Silicon Valley understands software as a service. That's printing cash. That's not burning up working capital. It's a really different alignment. And honestly, I don't recommend that kind of growth. We had a 75% cumulative average growth over about seven years. I do not recommend that to anyone building a retail company. Incredibly dilutive to everyone involved. And I say that it's not accretive you know, building it slower, building it more profitably. You know, these are all the lessons I learned, you know, as a first time entrepreneur building a retail brand. I mean, I'd love to hear your whole take about your gender throughout your career. But in particular, there is a stereotype of a bro culture out in California. And I'll tell you the first meeting Serena and I went into. This is sure. no joke. We got patted on the head by one of the partners who walked in. We were sitting at the conference room with his other partner. The other one came in. He patted both of us on the head and said, you girls sure have been busy like that. I'm not, I can't even make this up. And then we were in the middle of a deal with another guy and very, very famous venture guy on the East Coast 
who's no longer with us. He literally wanted to pull out of the deal when he found out that Serena was pregnant. He thought for sure she was going to abandon this company. You know, he goes, well, one of my employees that worked for me for 12 years, you know, she got pregnant and never came back. And I'm like, uh huh. You know, there's certain things I think are generational, but that doesn't mean it's we should let them pass. <laughs> it's just I think there's delicate ways to sometimes educate people and and sort of give them aha experiences to these kinds of things. What would you say to a young twenty something female today who's got an idea and wants to run with it and find investors? I was building a company. None of these consumer brand investors were around. None of these women led funds were around. So, you know, I think we're really making serious progress. I do recommend to any entrepreneur to cut their teeth, you know, inside of other companies, especially companies that have gone through startup phases and have actually, you know, work in a big company, work in a startup company. You'll have the blend of both Mm -hmm. to know what both look like because, you know, working in a big company gives you a perspective of where you need to go from a, you know, a corporate organizational chart standpoint. It gives you perspective on what real companies look like and how they're run. I I would not have traded my 17 years in corporate America for anything in terms of my entrepreneurship background. I'm very happy in the private sector. And also I've always worked in multinational matrix organizations. And I I thrive there. I love thinking about the geographies and the functions. And of late, I've started liking it to a Rubik's Cube, where it's not just the geography and the verticals, but it's across time. Because what you're dealing with today is not going to be what you're dealing with tomorrow. And if you start to think that way, then you can be a little bit more prepared, I think, for what's around the corner. You're bringing up a really good point. And it's something I actually teach a case down at Stanford about, which is really forecasting your org chart. Because what you need from zero to 5 million is so different than what you need from five to 20, different from 20 to 100. Like it actually keeps changing. And you have to, as an entrepreneur, you you are so loyal to your early folks and they're so loyal to you. And so, you know, one of the things, one of the big mistakes we make as entrepreneurs is title inflation. You know, we give these SV, you know, senior VP titles out or chief titles out to people because we can't pay them enough. So we give them a big fat title. But then when it's time to actually have a chief marketing officer and we have a director level marketing person in the seat, it's it's tough. And so I always just, you know, warn entrepreneurs about title inflation and just managing your org chart with integrity. Topic of an article in last week's Economist. Um, mm. Just like you have great inflation at the Ivies. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, again today on The Caring Economy, we have Lily Cantor with us. She is a serial entrepreneur based out in California, but has worked both in the private sector for nearly two decades and then uh, been a serial entrepreneur ever since. Lily, can you talk a little bit about purpose? And by purpose, I mean higher purpose. You talked about aligning capital with your business and building something. How do you approach purpose? So for me, purpose is knowing really what your what your superpower is what what gifts you have and how can you apply those gifts in the world to leave the world better than where when you arrived and so i really try to be very introspective on that at different phases of my life in terms of how can i add value given what i know how to do well of course i find purpose in my love relationships of my family most certainly my husband and i have found a lot of purpose in our travel with our family but i do think at the end of your days it's like what have you done in this world and what legacy can you leave one of the things i know how to do really well is build brands and build companies so I'm at this stage now where I've done that. It's been incredibly successful. Serena and Lily is is valued in somewhere in the billion dollar range now. I'm now trying to figure out how do I take my building brand and building companies and figure out how to crack the code on reimagining capitalism so that it can actually fuel the nonprofit world and I just feel like this this dynamic where the nonprofit world's always like waiting for the next check, try to figure out how we can use business to fuel the needs of the nonprofit world. 
I mean, we're seeing a lot in the social impact space, family offices, you know, taking less of a return for more of an impact kind of thing. But I wonder if you have any examples of things out there already that you say, hmm, that's something to follow or something to look at. Ronald Cohn wrote the book Impact. He is suggesting that impact is going to be our next unicorns. I absolutely believe that. I, I think that changing the world and especially related to climate right now, the innovation that's going to happen in that field is needed. I actually do optimistically believe that those are our next unicorns. You know, in terms of what we've learned, commerce on top of a fundraising engine is a really powerful model. I think the jury's still out on B Corps, but you know we're seeing more of them, but I think it's still too early to say. I also am not too conversant in, but I am interested in the universal basic income models that are putting cash into people's hands in a guaranteed way. But there's lots of experimentation happening, which is a good thing. Going to a completely different spot then is last week's news about the fusion, the uh, successful fusion test. And that, if that bears fruit in 20, 30 years, that also can be one of those unicorns in ways that we can't even conceive of. So I like that metaphor. I think that we need a lot of serious policy change in this country related to how we build our tax models um, and how we reward companies for a broader distribution of the income that's being created from them. I think this dynamic um, between the very top and the very bottom is honestly absurd. And I don't, you know, it just, it's very troublesome for me to even think about it. Um, honestly, like everyone that started was in the early days of Serena and Lily sat on the cap chart, regardless of where you were in the company. And I just think we need to be working on those models that really create level playing fields for everyone that contributes to the success of a company. Mm-hmm. We need to be working on, we need to be working very hard on living wages right now in this country because they aren't, they just flat out aren't. We've had way too much disparity between one's life, you know, regardless of city. That one really troubles me to continue to see that disparity of the billions being created and not flowing through. I, I talk often about mindshare, and there ought to be ways of, in a certain sense, regulating mindshare so that it's not monopolized. So Elon Musk is the latest one. You know, the, the amount of attention that he gathers and can influence stock prices or news cycles, it, it's just no one person should have that much influence. And I feel the same way with social media platforms that are, you know, they're not treated like media organizations. And yet many people, that's the first source of news. Mark Zuckerberg has some accounting to do for genocides in Myanmar and a lot of other things. We'll get there. But to your point, we do need to do a little bit more of a serious dive into some of these major, major challenges because the level playing field is also fictitious at this point. What's it like being the only woman in the house? Because my mom raised five boys and she would have never had it any other way. Five boys. And two, wow. um, how, do you, how do you grow them vis-a-vis tech as a set of fine young men? My boys are all very different. My oldest boy is doing agroecology in college right now, which is a study of agriculture with food justice. Um, And, you know, one of the things my husband has always said is we just need to go back to the land. And he's definitely going to live that life uh, working, you know, either in urban farming or related to uh, food justice. My middle boy is doing aerospace engineering and he's literally a rocket scientist. (laughs) Love it. And, my, and my youngest one, he's just in still in high school. So TBD. Did they grow up with tech and Game Boys and all this stuff? Say my oldest one was like Club Penguin and Minecraft. So it wasn't this like rapid kind of gaming that was, which is now really prevalent. I would say my youngest is probably the most that grew up the most in it. My boys, you know, kind of burned out on it. And how's about your peer group out there? There's definitely like an exodus happening in the Bay Area over COVID because people could work from other places. The affordability of living in California is very difficult, to be frank. And so a lot of folks that were able 
to work remotely, went and set up lifestyles elsewhere, lifestyles that didn't have huge tax codes. And, you know, I think there's been a lot of that. I'm definitely feeling a wave and maybe it's just the circles that I run in, but I'm feeling a wave towards impact, um, towards investing in impact, towards climate. I'm definitely feeling that wave coming on right now. I think people are are tired of, of the non-purpose. We're certainly seeing that with millennial and Gen Z in terms of where they want to work and what they want to do. And you have a focus group at the dining table every night with your sons. Yes. You know, if nothing else, there's always going to be, I think, that great experimentation that's going on out there, which is thrilling. But my last question for you is just your pearls of wisdom gleaned through the years. You've shared some already, but I wonder what you might say both to um young professionals starting out in their careers, but then maybe older professionals who've been disrupted. They've been because of COVID or reorgs they've been put out on the street, so to speak. I wonder what advice you give to young and old people. Well, I think at the end of the day, you know, it's about your purpose and your happiness. And I'm not sure that that has to be around money. Um, And I think that we can find our happy place. Um, As they say, the happiest people on the planet are just above the poverty line. So I I feel like sometimes people stay in roles and do things that they're not excited about um, because they're kind of locked in a a system of needing a certain amount of salary. But, you know, listen, life is short. A friend of mine shared this quotient with me, which was QTL, quality time left, you know, and weighing everything against QTL. I just think it's really important to kind of follow your North Star in terms of what brings you meaning. And when you follow that, then you're happy. That's my pearls of wisdom. (laughs) I agree with that. Lily Cantor, so great catching up with you today. I can't wait to follow your ongoing success and seeing you, Mark, sometime in the new year. But now, thank you for joining us on The Caring Economy. Thank you.